morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Unicus Radio Hour. I'm your host, Robert Stanley. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, a lot of people have been asking me about the mysterious Dr. J, clinical psychologist that contacted me regarding the, about archons or demons, I guess some people call them. We're fortunate that Dr. J is actually granting us an interview. This is, this is really, uh, he's putting himself out on a limb to do this. Here's a little bit about him. He graduated on the dean's list from a major university on the East Coast with a B.A. in psychology and a minor in criminology. He's earned a master's degree in counseling from a different major university, again, on the East Coast. He was both a research assistant and a teaching assistant while in an APA-approved Ph.D. counseling psychology program. He has over 35 years of frontline clinical experience in working with people who hear voices. He has worked, Dr. J has worked on the front lines of one of the largest state psychiatric hospitals in the world, uh, for seven years, he's worked in one of the largest mental health centers in this, in a particular state here in the United States for two years. He spent 16 years working in the psychology department of a large state prison learning about how, quote-unquote, the voices worked and dealing with the criminally insane for 16 years. He's currently a licensed clinical therapist and has worked in the emergency rooms of large uh, cities and county hospitals during doing psychiatric crisis work for over eight years. He's won an Instructor of the Year Award for teaching abnormal psychology at a large community college. He has been awarded the State Meritorious Service Award for Psychology and Substance Abuse Programs developed for the Department of Corrections and has been hired as a consultant to institute the same programs in other states. He is currently working closely with a team of psychiatrists in a large private hospital emergency room screening and evaluating psychiatric patients that come into the ER. Dr. J, welcome to the program. Great to be here, Robert. Uh, yeah, I just want to make it clear that, you know, I have no ulterior motive for doing this broadcast other than to get the truth out to people. I've got no book to sell. I've got no website to promote. I'm not getting any monetary gain whatsoever, and I have a fair amount to lose because uh, neither psychiatry nor the big drug companies are going to like what I have to say. <clears throat> I'm, I'm taking this risk for those of you who are out there who are able to comprehend what I'm going to tell you, which in some cases is stranger than fiction. Let's begin at the beginning. How it, how was it that you came to the awareness that uh, that these voices were not some sort of chemical imbalance in the patient's brain? Well, it, let me start from the very beginning because okay. uh, you know my my very strong mistrust of authority is overriding all of this. Strong mistrust of authority figures. Period. I mean, it's ingrained. When I got into uh, college, I was immediately attracted to abnormal psychology. I mean, I just had a a fascination with it. And all through my undergraduate years, here we're reading about all these clinical populations and these different uh, mental disorders, but there was no actual experience of these populations. You just had to trust what the psychologists and the book writers were saying. And for somebody who has a strong mistrust of authority, that was not easy for me. What is what is abnormal psychology? Mental disorders, schizophrenia, delusions. Oh, um, I see. Like, like on the far end of the normal scale, mental illnesses. You know, I had my suspicions. As, as I was going through undergraduate school, um, here comes a professor and says, well, if, you know, if two delusional patients ran into each other with the same delusion, one would have to give way. I'm going, well, why would that have to happen? They're, you know, they're both crazy. Why would one have to give way to the other? What kind of rationale is behind that? It's stuck in my mind, and I, I just couldn't get rid of it. Yeah. So I couldn't prove it either, so I logged it in there. And not having access to clinical populations to see for myself really bothered me. And then another time, uh, another professor came up and said, well, schizophrenics are, are much too disorganized to carry out any kind of advanced planning. And that just didn't sit right either. Didn't make sense. So log that one in. So after I finished my master's degree, I finished a BA in psychology, finished my master's degree in, in counseling. Uh, I was hired on at one of the largest state hospitals in the entire world. I mean, it was immense. Now I had access to clinical populations. Um, I could actually see for myself. And when I first got in there, I mean, it was just a, a whole world of abnormal deviance. I, you know, I remember sitting in the cafeteria one day of the hospital cafeteria. I mean, the, the place was so big, it was like a city unto itself. There, there were like 23,000 mental patients in this place. And I remember <laughs> that was huge. I remember sitting in the cafeteria and here one of the conversations were about a psychiatric patient, a schizophrenic who cut his penis off. And the talk of the cafeteria was, you know, they sewed it back on. 
it was like, oh, is it taking? You know, everybody was interested. Is it is it going to stay on there? And my question was, why did he do it? You know, now he, this didn't happen on one of my units. It happened on a unit of a friend of mine who was also uh, uh, working there with a master's level degree. And I asked him. I said, uh, you know, go ask that guy why he cut his penis off. <laughs> so he comes <laughs> he comes back the next. I always wanted to know why. He comes back the next day. He goes, oh, he told me. He told me. So what did he say? Well, he told me he didn't need it anymore. <laughs> wow. Oh, okay. For me, it was a fascinating place. So one day, um, remember the delusional thing they said uh, when I was an undergraduate, you know, if two, uh, two mental patients met each other, yeah. one of them would have to give way? Right. You know, one day I'm making, I'm making my uh, clinical rounds on, on the psychiatric unit, and I see a new, new patient that I hadn't met before, and he's just wandering around kind of peacefully, and... You know, it was my job to kind of keep an eye on who was what and, and who was off their meds and who was dangerous and who was new and, you know, it was kind of the watchdog for the psychiatrist. <clears throat> so I walked up to this guy and I go, uh, hey, man, you know, who are you? And he looks him straight in the eyes and he goes, I'm Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I go, okay, this is my chance. No, no, you can't be Jesus Christ because I am. Ah. And he looks at me like stunned and he, he thinks for a minute. And I'm going, okay, okay, here's the verdict, it's coming. And he, and he looks at me and he goes, okay, we can both be Jesus Christ. <laughs> <Drive off. laughs> so I'm going, all right, so much for trusting the friggin' clinical textbooks. So what else are they lying to me about? About a year later, here comes an opportunity to check out another one. This, this one was like uh, the, the schizophrenics can't plan anything. They're too disorganized. And this one happened while I was in the Ph.D. program. On, on another unit where my friend worked, there was a psychiatrist, like I said, at the state hospital here. They didn't have the highest quality state psych- psychiatrist. The psychiatrist, a thin guy. He dressed, acted, and looked like Dr. Freud. He smoked a pipe like Freud. He had a beard like Freud. But he, he had uh, one schizophrenic guy. I mean, he didn't like him very much. And that's one thing I noticed later was that, you know, the psychiatric patients didn't like psychiatrists. They assaulted them at a much higher rate than it. This one was kind of funny, you know, the planning thing. Here's this psychiatric patient who had it in for Dr. Freud there. About three in the morning one night, this psychiatric patient snuck down three or four flights of stairs passed all the attendants. He, he went down to the first floor. He somehow broke into Dr. Freud's office there. He climbed up, closed the door, climbed up onto the middle of his desk, pulled down his pants, and took a crap right in the middle of his Jeez. desk. <laughs> shaped it into a pipe <laughs> and then escaped from the hospital. <laughs> they never saw him again. Professors saying, oh, no, schizophrenics can't plan anything. I yeah. mean, you know, that was artfully planned and executed, and they never caught the guy. So here's, here's my suspicion about what these people are telling me and me having to trust it, you know, in the dumps. And again, I'm going, you know, okay, so, you know, they're telling me this crap. What else are they making up or, or just saying is, you know, I, I didn't know. Right. So it was, but my suspicions were heightened, were greatly heightened. You know, my first encounter with schizophrenics was I didn't like them. They were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I only read about them. Once I got to meet them, I, I couldn't understand them. I didn't like them. I didn't understand them. I couldn't help them. I didn't know what to do with them. And neither did anybody else. You know, the only thing they knew to do with them was uh, drug them. And, you know, I tried to understand them, and there was this incomprehensible self-destruction in them. I mean, they would go for a little while, and then they would start self-destructing. I mean, it was... Just, I, I couldn't understand it. It made no sense. I remember one guy, I mean, he was an incredible artist and painter. He, he painted this beautiful scene of a, a water mill and, and a lake, and I mean, it was just gorgeous. And I looked at it, and the next day I went back to his room to, to talk to him, and he had painted swastikas all over this, and, and these weird sayings, uh, and, you know, he completely destroyed the picture. The other thing that didn't make any sense is I found myself being a glorified uh, nursemaid for schizophrenics who weren't taking their medicines. They, they were not taking their medicines at an unprecedented rate. How would you, how'd you find that out? They just start falling apart. You know, you're walking down the hall and then all of a sudden they start, you know, talking to somebody or doing weird stuff. You know, they weren't going to, that's the last thing they were going to do was tell me they weren't taking their medicine. At that point, the only thing I knew to do was turn them back into psychiatry and say, okay, he's not taking them, now you need to inject him. And they don't want that happening. So, no, they weren't, they weren't about to tell me anything like, and, you know, are you taking your medicines? No. I mean, and this happened at an unprecedented level. Schizophrenics would 
they were decompensated into a hellish psychosis. It was awful. I mean, they'd, they'd hear voices, they'd see demons, they'd have nightmares, they were paranoid. There, there's no comparison if you rationally look at which one is worst. The decompensation in the psychosis is worst. And if you ask yeah. them, you know, what's worst, they'll tell you, well, the psychosis is worst. I asked them, why aren't you taking your medications then? It didn't make any sense. It just made no sense to me. Mm-hmm. You know, the medication side effects were not anywhere near as bad or as hellish as the psychosis. One day, one day I got called up to uh, an office where uh, there was a, a schizophrenic girl, and her mother was up there, and they wanted me to come up there and talk to both of them. And she was not taking her medications. And her mother was there with us, and I asked her, I said, why, why aren't you taking your medications. You know, I'd, I'd ask them all that. You know, yeah. It just didn't make any sense. And then this one, all of a sudden, she says, because the voices told me not to. Huh. And that's the first time I had heard that, but I logged it in. It's like, that's interesting. I, I wouldn't just go on what one patient said. I, I began asking other schizophrenics, you know, do the voices ever tell you anything about your medicines? What do they say about your medicines? One after another after another, it was a positive. Uh, they were st- the voices were clearly telling them not to take their medications. Huh. That the, the psychiatrists were trying to poison them. The psychiatrists were trying to kill them. That the, the medications were ruining their nerves, and the, the voices would actually point to the side effects and say, "Look at you! These are side effects of you dying. I mean, you're, you're they're poisoning you. What is going on here?" And I, I began asking them, "Are the voices telling me anything else?" The, the content of the voices was consistently negative, consistently self-destructive messages, isolation that would cause them severe problems. And, and I'm going, well, well, you know. What kind of what kind of disease would tell the patient not to take the medication to alleviate the symptoms of the disease? That that made no no sense to me. I keep I, I interviewed. I mean, I worked with scores and scores of psycho, psychiatrists, psychologists, and, and psychiatric nurses, and they insisted. I mean, there was no doubt in their mind that the voices were hallucinations. It was a symptom of the disease. There's nothing else. You know, and they weren't even curious about it. I mean, they cut it off at that point. They are hallucinations. That's all there is. You know, that's a, don't ask anymore. That's the way. That's what I was taught. That's what everybody believes. That's the way it is. Okay, if they're hallucinations, why are they 99% negative? Why aren't they like other hallucinations? Why aren't some of them positive, some of them negative, some of them neutral, and some of them just pure nonsense? I mean, that's how hallucinations work. Yeah. You know, they yeah. don't have any guidelines they're just all over the place they're as individual as the person not these things these things were consistently consistently negative they told the patient to do destructive things and and this was true over space and time over years over different psychiatric units and later over states and different institutions across the united states it was all the same it was all negative you know as i asked about the voices i I got pulled up by psychiatry several times saying listen don't be asking about the voices. It upsets the patients. What it did, it did do that, and you're reinforcing the psychosis. So here, here they are cutting me off. The patients and the voices got upset when I did ask about them. I, you know, I have to, I have to grant them that. The voices didn't want the patients talking about them or telling anybody about them, and I, I couldn't understand that. That didn't make a lot of sense to me either. I kept asking psychiatry, well, what, what is the cause of this? You know, what, where do they come from? What are, what are the voices? What, oh, 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 it's a chemical brain imbalance. Oh, yeah? On the other hand, I didn't have any friggin' idea what the chemical balance of the brain was supposed to be. There was nothing that indicated it's supposed to have this much serotonin, this much acetylcholine, this much uh, nothing. It's almost like it, they were just repeating this from what they heard in school. There were no charts. There was nothing that indicated what the normal average chemical brain balance should be. This is absolutely bizarre. You know, they're psychiatrists, they're doctors, and they say, okay, this is the way it is. Everybody else believe it. We're the medical guys. Trust us. We know everything. You know, what, what, what became real clear was that you know, psychiatry wasn't treating the cause of this disease, treating the, the symptoms. symptoms. You know, it was real clear that they weren't getting at the cause of whatever this was. They, right. they were treating the symptoms. And, and even though I didn't know what these things were, I halfway believe they might be hallucinations. I, I, there's a lot of stuff adding up that they weren't hallucinations, but I had no idea what they were. Mm-hmm. Nobody else seemed to know either. And what I was seeing was not consistent with what psychiatry was telling me about these things being hallucinations, but I didn't know what they were. 
uh, I was starting to think, well, they're not hallucinations. What evidence do they have that these things are hallucinations? What evidence do they have that these things are <clears throat> the product of a biochemical brain imbalance? And if you push them hard enough, and the drug company representatives also, if you ask them long enough and hard enough, they would have to admit they do not know what causes schizophrenia. And yet they won't even look at the voices. Nobody has done a study of the voices or what they were, how they operated. Uh, there was nothing written on them. There, you know, they were. It, it was decreed that they were hallucinations, and period. That was it. Nobody, nobody went past that. And it was like, why? That struck me as so freaking bizarre, especially in terms of the stuff that I was seeing and the massive problems that these voices caused. And they knew they were causing yeah. because the patients would tell them, "Yeah, the voices told me to cut my wrist. The voices told me to escape from the hospital." It was clear that the the root of this problem were the voices. And still, they showed no interest. None. As far as they're hallucinations, we say they're hallucinations. They have no proof they're hallucinations. That's the way it is. That's the way we've been taught. That's the way we've been taught for generations. You know, you want to go back to the Middle Ages, you could believe they're demons. Modern science, they're hallucinations. Man, what is going on here? This is the root of the problem, and they're not looking at it. So I got nowhere with psychiatry. I finally gave up. Okay, so how, what was the tipping point for you? How did you come to this awareness that these things were actually external to the patient? It started building up. So I started asking the patients. Because right. I would get nowhere with, psychi with psychiatry. And what I found is that when I started questioning the, po the patients about the voices, they became more irritated. They became more agitated. And I was given warnings by psychiatry and other psychiatrists, don't be irritating, don't be talking to them about the voices. It irritates them, it sets them off, and, and then we have to deal with it, and you're reinforcing the hallucinations. You know? and, and that was true. You know, voices didn't want to be talked about, the patients didn't want to talk about them. I mean, there was nothing positive about them telling people about voices. It was always negative. They would end up isolated, they would lose their friends, everybody would think they're weird, the psychiatrists would drug them. There's no positive outcome, you know, for them to talk about the voices, none. And when I started off, I, you know, I thought, well, they were hallucinations. But if the patient picked that up, that I believed they were, and that I wasn't even giving them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, they wouldn't say anything. Uh -huh. They wouldn't waste their time. They would just clam up. If I took a neutral stance, they would talk a lot more about them, despite the fact that the voices were screaming at them not to. And if I asked them, I, you know, well, what do you think they are? You know, I'd ask the patient, what do you think they are? The, the overwhelming majority would say, I think they're demons. And that's what they've been telling psychiatry for years, you and, know, which is not being heard at all. I mean, yeah. But, yeah, the, the overwhelming would say they're demons, they're and, evil. So after seven years of working at that state hospital, I had only learned a handful of, they were, they were very important things. And it was information that didn't exist in other places. One thing I found was was odd was that on Sundays when psychiatric patients uh, were allowed to get off the, the wards and get out of the hospital and go to church, I mean, that was a big thing for them, the schizophrenics refused to go. And they didn't like preachers. And I went, that's strange. And this was consistent. They got upset. And there was something very strange going on here. The schizophrenics in, in overwhelming numbers insisted the voices were demons, which is strange, but since they were all negative and telling them to do all these rotten things, I mean, that was, you know, see where they would come to that conclusion. What are, the other thing I found really strange was psychiatry and psychology would not permit investigation into these things. I mean, if they caught you talking about the voices with the with patients, oh, you're reinforcing the hallucinations, man, you're making them worse, you're just, don't do that, you're just, you know, they're hallucinations, and, you're, you know, by giving them any kind of credence at all, you're making it worse. You know, on the other hand, the patient's feeling abandoned, like nobody's listening to me. It's like they're cut off, like, okay, you're crazy, you're having hallucinations, and nobody understands them. You know, things drastically changed after I went to work at the, uh, for the psychology department of the state prison. Uh, I had a lot of latitude to investigate there. There were a number of schizophrenic patients who were just as curious or more so about the voices than I was. And they were, they were willing to try some things. Okay, what impact does this have on them? If you do this, what do they say? What do they do? How do they act? What do they? And a lot of times, he would, they would tell me, oh, the voices are calling you all these rotten names. It became common, like, oh, they're calling you an asshole now. They're saying, don't listen to him. He's crazy. But it always came through the, the prisoner. Well, they're telling me to tell you this. You know? 
you know, lots of times uh, they ask them, how did the voices start? And it was interesting. It was like some of them, when they first started, it was like driving a new car. The voices would tell them, it was almost like they were trying to see how much control they had. They, they'd tell them, oh, go pick up that pencil, or put your tongue on the mirror, or, or do these ridiculous things. It was almost like, how much control do I have over this mechanism? And then the first, uh, first prisoner that was really interested in the voices, uh, Colin Preston, uh, he used to be a, a, on the stock exchange in New York, a very successful uh, guy, lots of money. He was married, had a big house in New York, started using cocaine, uh, became psychotic, and lost it all. Eventually ended up in prison and uh, with, with a bunch of voices. And he was the first one that was willing to kind of sit down and, and tell me about these things. He was married for like 21 years or something like that. And I'd ask him, I said, how, how did you do that? How, didn't your wife know that you... You were hearing these things, and you go, no, well, I hit him from her. I'd go out in the garage, and I'd, uh, uh, I'd talk to him, and she'd catch me sometimes, and I'd tell her I was just talking to myself. And eventually he, he got to where he, he, he couldn't function, and his wife was uh, threatening with divorce. The voices didn't like his wife. They, they don't like wives. They don't like kids. You know, they would always tell him she's cheating on him, and, uh, and finally she had enough, and she was going to leave him. And he didn't care at all. Okay, fine. Yeah, that's okay. You know, that's even better. But he had no real good source of income then. He'd lost his job. He's about to, to crash. And, and when she saw that he didn't care at all about about her, she was furious. I mean, just absolutely furious. And she just gutted him. She just took everything she could from him. He mm. ended up a bum in, in the... Uh, uh, living in Central Park in a in a cave, listening to the voices, and, and he would eat. Uh, he would find these restaurants that threw out food at the end of the day, and he was happy doing this. And the voices were happy doing this. This this fellow, I mean, he's he he preferred to be with the voices and and eating stuff out of garbage cans and stuff. And he, he, finally, I would we would start working with. Okay, you know, do you want to get rid of these things? Do these things. You know, do opposite of everything they say. Right. And I would support him in that. And I said, listen, if you need us, you come come to my office and I'll help you out. I'll be, you know, just keep moving in a positive direction. Finally, one day, he's sitting there and the voices got fed up and they were getting weaker and weaker because he was doing positive things. He wasn't listening to what they were doing. I was supporting him. Yeah. He said that they screamed and then they left. Wow. And he's sitting, he's sitting there stunned. You know, just <laughs> stunned. <laughs> And, and and I'm looking at him, I'm like, is he okay? And he couldn't get up. He was disoriented. And he was like, just looking at me, and what happened? He said, they screamed and they left. And he said, the silence is deafening, because mm. he's heard him for decades. You know, and I'm like, wow, wow man. They left. And I, I kept track of him, so I'd bring him back every once in a while. They're still gone, they're still gone, they're still gone. Yeah. But he came in, he, he was reporting he was lonely. Of course. You know? They were his only friends. Wow. And Carlos Castaneda and Miguel Ruiz, uh, these Indian shamans, they've known about these things for thousands long, of long years. Long time, yeah, right. And a so did long the, time. Right, and so did the Gnostics. And I believe that's one of the reasons that the, the Library of Alexandria had to be destroyed, is because there was too, many, too much information there, too many writings about these things that would have exposed them to the populace. Well, they don't want to be exposed. No. They don't like what we're doing right now, that's for sure. Yeah, so oh, well. It, it turns out that this fella was so lonely that he called for him back. And, and he was working in the prison doing motor vehicle, answering the phones and stuff. And I'd stop by one day to see him, and he goes, yeah, I, I brought him back. I'm not lonely anymore. I'm okay. You know, this is how I want. Look, he was telling me the story about this one psychotic guy that called him on the phone one day. And we were both laughing about this. Uh -huh. And the guy was screaming at his voices over the phone, and, and Preston didn't know whether they were his voices or the other guy's voices. <laughs> <laughs> we were just rolling over there. The, the next one that was really fascinating was, uh, I'll call him uh, Lewis. He was a cocaine addict in San Diego, and he was psychotic and hearing voices and, uh, you know, drug abuser. At the time he was telling me this, the, the voices were gone. The voices told me that there was a pot field in Oregon, and to pack up uh, two two big burlap bags, and he had like $250 at the time, and take take his money, and they would show him where this pot field was. And I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I, I took the bag, got the burlap bags, took the money, and just was following their direction every step of the way. He drove from San Diego all the way up to Oregon, 
down like 30 miles of dirt road, and the road dead ended. And he goes, okay, now now what? And the voice said, take your burlap bags and go up that uh, hiking trail off to your left there. He woke, uh, walked four hours up that hiking trail. He got to the top of the mountain, and here's this huge the pot field. So he goes, man, wow. And he goes, and he cuts down two burlap bags full, and he takes it back down to his car, and he goes, okay, now what do I do? And the voices say, well, we, we know where there's a park. You can sell it. <laughs> so they go right into the park. I, I'm honest, honest to God. <laughs> honest to God, and I'm sitting there with my mouth wide open. He goes, well, they told me exactly where the park was. I went there. He said he sold hundreds of dollars worth of marijuana. He bought all the prostitutes that he could handle. He bought all the cocaine he could handle, all the liquor he could handle. And he was having the life of Riley. And he said the, the voices were fishermen. They wanted to go fishing. What? I go, what? <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. What? <laughs> he said, yeah, we went out onto the Columbia River. And he said the voices would tell him where to cast his hook, how long to leave it there you know, when to leave, when to move, and he was the only one on the river catching fish, and everybody else was looking at him going, how's he doing that? This went on for two weeks, prostitutes, cocaine, alcohol, and then he went to go up there uh, at the end of two weeks, and they said, nope, they're up there waiting for you. Go up there now, they'll kill you. You pack up your car, pack up the, the money you had, and he left with a lot more money than he came with yeah. and go back to San Diego, and he did. They, they warned him. Huh. So I'm like listening to this, and we go, holy mackerel, Andy. You know, since then, I talked to a number of prisoners that were hearing voices, and they would tell the prisoner which houses to rob, when to go in there, and when somebody was up, and when Whoa. to get out. Oh, yeah. The, you know, they would tell them where to get drugs. Dr. Ruiz, in his book, he, he claiming to be a Toltec, he says that these things are allies. So on some and level... So does Castaneda. Sort of. not Yeah, at some point he does kind of mention, or Don Juan admits to him that some of these allies are actually the flyers, and that they shapeshift and whatever. The, look, the point I'm trying to make is, there's a way to have a symbiotic relationship with these things, because they are intelligent. As, as long as they're getting something out of you, they want to keep you around. So at that point, it's not 100% parasitic. I mean, I think well, they look at us as being expendable, but do you agree with what I'm saying? Not completely, because okay. I, I think these these ones, I'm, they, they may have been talking about a slightly different something there, because they okay. could use those things. But they, you know, Castaneda did say that they are attracted to negative emotion. Okay. You know, and he said their frequency is much more like electricity, uh -huh. um, where ours is, is more like heat. I got ahead of myself with those two stories. I think where I, I was first not mowed over by these is I called one prisoner in there, and I read him something that Miguel Ruiz has written saying these things are parasitic, they are invisible entities, and they suck negative energy out of you after, you know. And I wanted to know what this prisoner thought about this. Yeah. Because he, we were working for months uh, together, and the voices were getting weaker and weaker and weaker. He was gaining more and more control. He was staying out of trouble with security. He was getting better and better. And, you know, I would ask him everything about the voices, and he would tell me, despite the fact that they beat him up a lot, he would get headaches, he would get sweats, he would still squeal on them. So I brought in this quote, and that was the one I sent you in that uh, story before, mm -hmm. uh, where th this was, uh, I think, from uh, Miguel Ruiz, where he's saying these things are parasitic entities, they live off of negative emotional energy, uh, they exist on the earth plane just like uh, we do, they've been here as long as we have, or maybe even right. longer, and they, they treat us like cows. We put them out to pasture to milk, they eat the grass, we isolate them, we milk them, put them back out there again. Yeah. These things, we generate emotional energy, and that's what these things feed off. They can't generate their own emotional energy. So I, so I read that to this guy, and I, you know, I was wanting his uh, opinion. Well, but even before that, I, mean, I got ahead of myself again. There was one day where he comes into my office, and he says... The voices want to talk to you. and They want to talk directly to me. They've never done that before. They always went through the patient. Uh, the voices are telling me to tell you that you're a jerk. You're crazy. You're, <laughs> a, you know, you're, you're you know, all this, all this rotten stuff. And I'd say, well, I'll tell them they're a bunch of fools and jerks and, and, you know, they can eat crap and die. And, you know, we'd have those kind of exchanges. I, I didn't know what I was talking to. I wasn't sure whether it was a separate part of the patient's mind or, uh, you know, as a subconscious or bad pro. I mean, that's just, it, it just I, I was confused until this guy comes in. He goes, the, 
the voices want to talk to you. And this is the first time that ever happened. And I was kind of taken back because they never addressed me directly. And I'm sitting back there like, man, what is going on here? And I said, okay, what do they have to say? And he looks me in the eye and his voice changes just a little bit. And he goes, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. And it just blew me away. Hmm. I mean, our way of life, this wasn't, this wasn't just the guy talking. This wasn't just, it's our, this is plural now. And I'm like, holy cow, what? Is, they are entities. That's where I first realized, like you asked, when did you first realize? It hmm. was then. And I was, I, I walked out of the office that day and I went, my God, they are entities. They are, they have an individual intent. They have a different intent. They are intelligent. This wasn't the patient talking. Right. And I'm like, holy cow, what, what am I getting into here? But I, I wouldn't let go. I, now I was intensely curious. So with the same guy, I kept working with him, working with him. He's getting better, 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 better. And then I read him that quote from, from Miguel Ruiz one day. The medicine man is saying, these are entities. They feed off of negative emotional energy. They exist with us. They're inorganic beings. Yeah. And I, I, I read him that, and I look up after I'm done reading, and he's staring at me with this zombie-like stare. It, it sent chills up my back, and I'm, he's just staring at me, staring at me. And I'm like, whoa, something bad's going on here. So I, I push my chair against the office wall just in case he's going to come at me. And so I'm getting ready to kick him off if I need to. And then all of a sudden, off to my right, there's this loud, like a like an arc welder, loud electrical crackle. And I'm like, what? What? <laughs> what is that? You know, I look over there and I see nothing. And then I look back at him and he's just staring at me with this weird zombie-like psychotic stare. And this crackle starts moving up my office wall to the right, toward the ceiling at about a 45-degree angle. And I'm looking to see if I can see anything there, but I'm afraid to take my eyes off of him because I'm thinking he's going to jump me any minute. Mm. And, and here I am flashing back and forth, back and forth, seeing if I could see anything. I could not see anything, but it was very loud. It started moving along the, the right-hand wall. It hit the wall over his head, turned over his head. Uh, and he's looking at me the whole time with this zombie-like stare. He's completely motionless. It hits the left-hand wall and starts coming down the left-hand wall at a 45-degree angle. And I'm like, oh, man, what, <laughs> what is going on here? And then it jumps into a Rubbermaid trash can right to the left of my foot. Mm -hmm. And that trash can is absolutely empty. And all there is is a plastic bag. And I can look down in there. There is nothing there. And I'm, I'm yeah. looking between him and, and this noise, afraid that, you know, if I'm paying too much attention, whatever this thing is, I didn't smell anything. I didn't feel anything. But, man, it was loud. And then it, it jumps in the trash can. It rattles there for a while. And then it disappears as suddenly as it came. And mm -hmm. I'm, I look at him, and I go, did you hear that? And he doesn't answer. He's just staring at me like he's in a, a zombie or something. And I'm like, whoa, what is going on here? And then he slowly gets up and he goes, I gotta leave. <laughs> and he shuffles down the hall. And I'm like, thank heavens, he's getting out of here. And I'm in absolute shock. I mean, I'm like, what just happened here? And I just like, I closed the door and I was just non functional that whole entire day. I'm going, this thing can do that if it can affect physical reality. What else can it do? How much danger am I in? What am I getting into? That's when I contacted Wilson Van Dusen, who wrote uh, The Presence of Other Worlds. He, he worked at a state hospital in California, and he actually gave uh, – he, he thought they were – uh, he could make friends with the voices. He, he was interesting. It took me a while to, to get through to him, but uh, he would. He, he had uh, patients. He was trying to make friends with the voices so he could find, you know, find out what they were and how they operated. I knew they were no good from the start. He, he treated them like friends. He actually gave an MMPI to a patient, and then had the patient's voice respond to that same MMPI. And and he said that the voices. MMPI came out much more psychotic than the patients. I found that interesting. What is an MMPI? What what is that it's, test? It's it's like the chief test of of clinical psychologists. It's like their holy grail. Is it like a lie detector? I mean, is that is it hooked up? It, yeah, it's got it's got several lie scales. It, no, it's a paper and pencil test called oh, the okay. Minnesota Multiphasal Multiphasic Personality Inventory. It's got a oh, bunch okay. of scales that measure all these different diagnoses. Gotcha. And, 
you know, it's got lie scales and validity scales, and it's probably the most researched test that psychologists use. And found that th- after that, I was afraid to uh, call this guy back for about a month. Finally, the, my curiosity got the best of me. I put out a pass and had the uh, guards bring him over to my office one morning about three weeks later. And he comes in, he's all smiley, and like I was expecting that he would just be eaten up by these things. Mm-hmm. And he goes, no, no, I've been doing what you said, and, and uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing real good. I'm, you know, I'm going to AA, I'm going to my programs. And I was shocked. I was still doing so good after what I just thought. I thought that just the very opposite would be happening after what I experienced. And then finally, neither one of us talked about that incident for a while. And then finally I got around to saying, uh, you know, hey, man, did you hear that? that crackling the last time you were here and he goes yeah i did and he goes i'm surprised you did and i'm going yeah i mean he, i said what was it he said that was them you know that was the voices and i, I went well, what were they trying to do he said well they were trying to scare you and i said well they did a damn good job i asked him uh you know he, he was in that kind of zombie-like state as he was about leaving to ready to leave the office and i was curious about what was going on with him in that state so i asked him i said uh you know, what were the voices telling you as you left the office? And he said, uh, well, they, they were telling me, to go get a, telling me to go get a shank, which is a homemade prison knife, yeah. stick it in your belly. And I, I'm thinking, oh, well, he didn't do it because, uh, you know, we, we're kind of friends kind of thing, and I'm trying to help him out. I said, well, why didn't you do it? And he said, because I couldn't find one, and nobody would give me one. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's where I kind of realized that these things were dangerous yeah they they really are and as we were saying before they uh they really don't want us to be doing what we're doing you have done a lot of great work quietly behind the scenes actually you have to do it in secret otherwise you could lose your job or be sued by the medical mental health profession doesn't uh approve of what you're doing not at all not at all i got called in front of an inquisition at the prison demanding to know what i was doing questioning the prisoners and there was one that they cornered he, he was one who heard the voices had disappeared he stopped taking his medicines which you know according to psychiatry that can't happen the chief psychi- psychologist goes uh and why'd you stop taking your meds well the voices went away you know i was talking to this guy and uh, me and uh, he started demanding of that prisoner what what we were talking about yeah you know, of course he couldn't tell him so he, what he responded in turn was you know he's helping us not like you asshole they went oh my god <laughs> yeah <laughs> he shouldn't have to do that the psychologist had a valid mmpi profile on this on this particular prisoner before i started working with him it showed that he was psychotic so he asked the prisoner will you take another one uh-huh. now that you stop taking your medicine and he did and it came out to be a valid profile, and it did not show psychosis. My supervisor at that point went nuts. I mean, I thought he'd be happy. I mean, you don't have to give this guy any more medicines, man. You don't have to worry about him anymore. He's he's off and running. He's back in school. And No, no, no. Uh, I was experimenting with prisoners, and that was very dangerous, and that was against all you know rules and regulations. So I got called up in front of an inquisition, in front of the medical director, the chief psychiatrist, a chief psychologist, and they were all hammering me as the, yeah. what are you doing, what are you doing? And I, you know, I couldn't tell them. Right, but if you had their permission, it would have been fine. Yeah. If you'd, if you'd had legally had some authority to do that it, within their parameters, it would have been fine, right? Yeah, but you're not going to get it. You know, after these prisoners started recovering, a handful of them, at about 3.30 or 4 in the morning, I would feel crushed into the bed. It was like something was crushing me into my bed, and I could feel it. My whole body was being crushed, and I was terrified. You know, so I started praying and asking to, for, for Jesus and the guardian angel to drive these things away, and they eventually went. And there was an exorcist working at the, at the prison who uh, I found out through another inmate, because one of, one of the ones that I had helped went and told him. And I went and talked to him. I said, what is going on with this? Because, you know, I had nobody to talk to. I can't talk to my wife. She's terrified. Yeah. You know, you can't talk to anybody you work with because they think you're a, a lunatic. So I went to him, and I said, what is going on here? And he goes, oh, I don't worry about that. They do that to scare you <laughs> half a million, million times. It's like it's old hat. Yeah. You know? That I'm like, holy cow. You know, so it's, that happened several times. And, and now, yeah, they even gave up on doing that because after a while it, it didn't bother me. But now I can feel them when they're there. Right. And they come, at, they come out 
at, at the point where I'm telling somebody that these things are entities and they are parasites and they will they feed off of negative emotional energy. That's why you're being fed all this negative stuff all yeah. the time. Kill yourself. Hurt yeah. it. it generates negative emotional energy and then there's a huge energy drop. Right. Where after the voices leave, these people are drained. They're absolutely drained. They can't get out of bed. They have no energy. And you ask them, where's the energy go? Oh, I don't know. Well, you, you know what may be a little shocking to your listeners is that we're – this became very clear because I was working with the top 1-5% of the population, you know, where it becomes very clear. But the truth is that all of you people out there listening are being attacked by these things constantly. They are putting negative thoughts in your head and trying to get you to act on them. And they can smell negative emotion like a shark can smell blood. Yep. If something bad happens, they will amplify it. Yep. And then you'll feel that you are weakened after you get all upset. They live off of negative emotional energy, and they will put in every negative thought that comes into your head is put there by them. Right. So and, and that's that's an excellent point. I'm glad you made that. You don't have to be clinically diagnosed as being schizophrenic or psychopathic to be under the influence, to some degree, of these entities that we're talking about here. And that and that's why the you know the Bible has you know forgive your your enemies, concentrate on positive stuff, and that's another thing. That you ask these schizophrenic guys to read the Bible, they can't do it. They can't concentrate. The voices kick up. They start screaming. They start hollering. They won't let them concentrate. If they go into it, you're ever sitting in a church and somebody runs, gets up and runs out, that's, that's probably <laughs> one of them. Well, you know, they cannot stand the church. They cannot stand the Bible. But if you give them a horror story to read, they can remember every single detail of that mm-hmm. horror story. So it's, it's like these things are reinforcing the negative. Yeah. So as, as human beings moving into this new higher frequency we're all moving into yeah. when something good happens to you amplify it just like they amplify the back right. do things that are good for you do things that you enjoy you know love yourself don't act out of fear because they can smell fear like a, a, a dog attacking when you run you have the free will to choose between negative and positive and the more negative choices you make the more self-destructive choices you make the more choices you make to increase the negativity in your mind the further down that dark hole you travel on the other hand if you start choosing positive stuff moving in a positive spiritual direction doing things that you enjoy helping other people helping yourself and move in a positive direction you know that's going to increase you know without them and I, you know i have no doubt that god allows them to exist but they allows right. them to exist to teach us a lesson you know if that's the direction you want to move you're going to end up like these psychotic patients here negative energy and these things feed on that that's a treasure trough the prisons are god darn cesspools for these things i mean you walk into a prison and you can just feel it the heavy, negative, no good thing will be unpunished in one of those places because of the negative energy. I, I remember watching this little 100-pound psychotic guy bounce three big guards around the inside of a cell like they were popcorn. You know, the scariest one was a devil worshiper once that, that I spoke to him. I mean, some of the horrible things they did was, you know, it's like, you know, and I asked him one time, he, he said, I said, do you ever see Satan? And he goes, yeah, I've seen him. You know, and I was expecting it to be some horrible, I mean, he said, no, he's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. The the truth's got to go out. The first thing is to realize that these things do exist. You know, they have told patients, you know, when the patient, when they ask them, you know, who are you? They say, well, we're you, we're your thoughts. No. And and the the patient kind of going, well, what, you know, and they will (laughs) ask me, well, how do I tell them apart from my own thoughts? And I say, by the intent. Right. Was it your intent to get thrown in prison? Was it your intent to right. murder this guy? Was it your intent to use cocaine? Was it your intent to lose your job? Was it your intent? And they'll go, no, no, that wasn't my intention. And then the question becomes, well, then, Who? whose is it? We need to discern between the voices that we hear. In, is it ours or is it external? And in the Bible, yeah. I believe that this is what the, the, the quote was, is you would know them by their fruits. Right. This is how we discern them. Is the intent, as you said, was the intent benevolent towards you, or is it malevolent? Well, yeah, that, that's probably the main thing, because yeah. the negative ones sound just like your regular thoughts. They can. You know, they don't sound any different than your regular thoughts. You, you think and you have the same, no, there's no change in tone, there's no change in, in amplitude, there's no, it's, it comes through like a regular thought. You just have to be careful 
to, to watch, the, the, you know, my original question that I asked that professor years ago, where do thoughts come from? Right. You know, they are being put in your head, and they are trying to get you to act on them, and that's what these voices do with the schizophrenics. They yep. put those thoughts in their head. Right. They say, this guy's going to beat you up. You better get him first. They can't make you act on them, right. but they can keep at it. Putting that in there and putting it, those thoughts come from other places. They don't all come from you. Yeah. When something good happens to you, amplify it, just like they amplify the back. Right. Do things that are good for you. Do things that you enjoy. You know, love yourself. Don't act out of fear because they can smell fear like a, a, a dog attacking when you run.